Good afternoon, everybody, and a very, very warm welcome to you all. You are joining us for this afternoon's Waterstones live event. Um, and if you're coming to us from a day at school or a day at work, or you're just coming to join us after putting the kettle on, then uh, like I say, a huge, huge warm welcome to you. We are very, very excited here at Waterstones today because we're going to be talking to three amazing authors. First of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Emma Carroll. I'm the author of Letters from the Lighthouse, Secrets of a Sun King and the soon to be published The Week at World's End. Now, I write historical fiction, so it's an absolute treat and a half for me today to be talking to three other authors who also have written historical fiction books that are also mystery stories and also include um, some rather interesting friendship groups, shall we say. So um, I've been reading these three books over the last couple of weeks and Oh, what a treat. I, honestly, I'm excited. I'm excited beyond belief to be talking to these authors about how they came to write their stories. So I really hope you're you're feeling that excitement, too, because it's going to be uh, it's going to be great. So let's introduce them then. So uh, we have Catherine Woodfine. We're going to be hearing from her in a minute. Now, this is her latest book, Nightfall in New York, and it's the final book in the Taylor and Rose Secret Agents series. Hello, Catherine. Hi. There she is. Woo <laughs> um, so really looking forward to hearing how you've tied up this incredible series and also what it feels like to say goodbye to two people who you've been writing about for a very long time. I mean, they must be very close to your heart, Sophie and Lil. Absolutely, yeah. 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 It's very strange to be saying goodbye. Oh, well, maybe au revoir rather than a, a goodbye. So welcome to Catherine. We're also going to be hearing from Lucy Iverson. Now, this is Lucy's debut middle grade story. She's written YA before with a co-author. Lucy's also uh, a school librarian so she's a bit of an expert on the old children's books uh, and this was such a, a joy of a book Lucy honestly it made me smile it was like a sort of Jeeves and Worcester come sort of House of Elliot sort of thing with the most brilliant voice your character is just adorable um we know that, that that just like I don't know just the way she talks the way she kind of gets really enthusiastic about everything and is sort of living in a little bit of a sort of bubble really isn't she until Myrtle sort of brings her very gently down to earth again so this was a fantastic book so thank you ever so much and I'm so delighted that there's going to be more of these stories because I've already read the bit you know went straight on to the the chapters at the back um, <laughs> so Lucy thank, thank you very very much lovely to be talking to you and finally, we have Ella Rissbridger. Ella is a poet. She's a woman of many talents, I have a feeling, actually. Lucy, uh, Ella is a poet. She is a food writer. She's written a book already called uh, Midnight Chicken. She writes for The Guardian and The Observer, has, has had a column in The Eye. Uh, and this is her debut um, for children. And it's sort of drawn, drawn its inspiration from The Secret Garden. And if that's not enough to tempt you already, it's an absolutely corkingly good read. So welcome to you all. How lovely to see you. Oh, Hi. Thanks, Emma. Lovely to be here. It's brilliant just... to be here. Yeah, absolutely. So, should we get cracking with some questions then? Oh, a couple of other little housekeeping things, first of all, before we start. First of all, all these authors' books are available to buy from Waterstones online. Um, and also, at about quarter past five, I think, we're going to be handing over to um, you for your question for questions and answers. So if you think of anything you'd like to ask any of our lovely authors during the, the session, then just put it in the Q&A box and we will go through those questions in about 35 minutes or so. OK, so but first of all, I've got a few questions I'd like to ask you if that's OK. Um, OK, so can you tell me, first of all, we'll start with you, Catherine, seeing as you're nice and big on the, on the screen. <laughs> What makes a cracking mystery story, in your opinion? Oh, it's, it's such a hard question, but I think really what it comes down to for me is that you have to really care. Like, it's great for your mystery to be exciting and twisty and to have all of those kind of thrilling elements that keep us turning the pages. But really, I think what it comes down to is the impact on characters that you care about and sort of what's at stake for them. Um, so that's something that, you know, all the way through the sort of eight books that I've written about these mm. characters, um, Sophie and Lil, who are appearing in Nightfall in New York, 
that's sort of really been there all the way through from their first adventure, The Clockwork Sparrow, which sort of all comes about because um, Sophie is sort of suspected from having been involved in this big uh, jewel theft. Um, so she has to prove her own innocence um, right up to this book, which obviously is sort of partly about doing the right thing, but also in it, it's about um, trying to save a character that that we we care about um, mm -hmm. a friend. So yeah, I think that has to be there, that connection to the characters and something that we really care about to sort of um, drive us as we're reading the mystery. That certainly happens in these books, doesn't it? I mean, just Sophie and Lil, during the course of their story, you really feel like they've you're with them and the stakes are really high for them. So they've got like personal stakes, haven't they? especially, you know, Sophie sort of you know, getting vengeance for the, you know, what's happened to her parents and stuff. You know, there's there's a really strong kind of motivator there, isn't there, for them on, on an emotional level. Mm, um, definitely and you know also the sense that there could be something bigger at stake sort of on yeah. the world stage and you know I don't want to jump ahead and start getting into too much about why this historical period is so interesting but of course there's so much going on at this point and there's a sort of real feeling that that what they're doing could have big consequences that's beyond mm -hmm. you know who stole the diamond necklace or whatever it mm -hmm. is um, and that was something that I sort of really thought would be um, fun and interesting to explore. Mm -hmm. Fantastic what about you Lucy? What do you think makes a good mystery? I mean, because you've obviously come to, at this from, from writing a different sort of genre okay. and for a different audience. I, was going to uh, say, I don't want to say um, a massive disclaimer from someone who doesn't know how to write a really good mystery, but is in awe of people who do. I mean, I think it's the tension. And also for me, I always think it's like you're a writer, but you're also a scientist because it's so you must have to do it so forensically. And, and I think, you know, in all of your books, it's like there's these moments, you know, I, I, I'm really bad for giving away <laughs> secrets. So I'm not going <laughs> to give away any secrets because I'm a terrible spoiler person. But, you know, there's a moment in this one I was just um, to do with the door and the heaviness. And I was, thinking, I was like, how do people think of this? <laughs> like, how is the brain working like this? Because my brain isn't that clever or skilled or like specific so I think it must be it must be about sort of an eye for extraordinary detail and I just I'm I can't I just I really am in awe of it in in all of your books but again and this is so layered this book mm. I, how it's not even one mystery it's like a trillion mysteries <laughs> and they're all weaved together so I I just yeah Emma, I just can't, I, I'm, I'm just so, I find it, to me, it's like being a magician. It's, it's, mm. I, I'm so in awe of people who can do it. It's a talent. I feel like my whole life I could work at it. But you are, I mean, your story is, is more of a sort of an adventure, isn't it? They're, they're, they're not actually solving a mystery, are they, as such, would you say? Yeah, no, because I, that would be, um, yeah, Ella and Catherine levels of, um, sort of genius that in that kind hang on a minute yours is fabulous I have to say let's not kind of you know well, stop beating yourself with no, the no, you no. know that and it, this is such a great story I loved it thank you but uh, I think I, I guess I'd love to know and maybe we can't talk about this now but um how you will plot um and how meticulously you have to go about giving out those clues yeah yeah we, we have a question on that actually in a minute funnily enough okay it wasn't yeah, so... me i didn't plant it <laughs> <laughs> and ella what about you what do you think makes a, a good mystery story then well first of all it's kind of thanks to lucy for being so nice about the plotting what i would say is a lot of write one draft figure out what you want to happen and then go back and say mm. how would how would this be revealed what would be a good clue i would say my first draft was a lot of clue here. They've got to find something. I spent mm. a lot of time with things in square brackets, being like, "Yeah, a clue." I think I think my character spent a lot of time saying, "We found a clue," and not having to expand what that clue was because I knew there would be a beat where a clue would happen. I knew they needed to know a bit more information than before, but I had no idea what that information was going to be until mm. I got to the end of the first draft, and I think, "Oh, okay." this would make a good clue. This can, I can kind of weave back in. So I would say it's a lot of trickery, really, writing a mystery, mm -hmm. as far as I can see. Um, I remember Agatha Christie said something about writing mysteries, which was that 
I, I'm going to paraphrase this and I'm going to get it wrong, but something about by the time you finish writing a mystery, you think it's so absurdly simple. You can't believe that everyone can't see from page one what you've done. And it's, you know, she talks about how, you know, Agatha Christie, queen of crime, a million perfectly plotted, perfectly executed murders or whatever. And she was just like, oh, I, as soon as I look back at my book, I think it's so simple. It's so obvious. These clues are so howling. So I think it's a lot to do with when you're writing it, you kind of go back and you seed the things yeah, all the way through. So it's kind of a bit of a magic trick, really. Mm. That's, that's sort of ed that's how editing, I think that, that's how ed editing works in, in a story. It's not a mystery as well. You know, you're kind of, you're always building up towards a kind of a reveal, aren't you? Or, or a kind of um, some sort of information being kind of, um, discovered so and, and again it's it, it's hinted that all the way through and that's not something you can put in a first draft is it that kind of comes with like you say with the layers and the edits and and all the rest of it it's a it's a trick I said tricky one though okay so well thank you very much for your answers I'm going to uh, move on to the next one now our next question is about friendships now all of your books have um little tight kind of groups of friends who a draw, either either already in the case of Catherine's book certainly already kind of um in that relationship that relationship's already been forged or we see that developing during the course of the book and we've got very very different characters that are sort of brought together by their experiences um so why have you done that let's start with you then Ella because you're here already on our <laughs> on our screen so why why did you think it was important to have well tell us about your different characters first of all and well I started off so the Secret Detectives is kind of inspired by this classic children's book, The Secret Garden, which maybe people watching have read, maybe they haven't, but it's a kind of Victorian book about a quite an angry little girl who's had a lot, I mean, she's kind of not that little, she's about 10. She's had quite a lot of stuff happen in her life. She's had quite a difficult time. And as a result, she has this very difficult connection with other kids. In the original book, she, the first time you see her interact with some other children, she's trying to make this garden and the other kids come over and want to know what she's doing and she tells them to go away and then they tease her and then she's horrible back and it's kind of this cycle of being spiky to each other. And I really related to that as a little girl. When I was sort of eight or nine or however old I was when I first read it, I really felt very strongly, oh, this is me. This spikiness and this kind of refractive spikiness where... I didn't quite know how I wanted to be with other kids and I didn't know how they wanted to be with me. And so it was really important to me to start with this character who kind of actively pushes people away. She actively mm. doesn't want friends and she says quite firmly, I don't like other people and I mm. don't need other people. And I think pretty much everybody, everybody in the world needs other people. You always, you're always connected to people whether you want to be or not. And so it was really interesting for me to kind of explore that in this story to explore how you go from pushing people away to letting them in mm. and I think that kind of I think so the other two characters in my kind of friendship group we've got a spiky girl who's called Isabel in my book a girl called Letty who is she's one of those kids who knows that grown-ups like her and I knew those kids I like many of them they are now my friends but she's very nice she's very polite she's quite invested in being a person who adults approve of and I thought oh that's a very different character to my spiky heroine and then there is Sam who is kind of just a dream best friend he wants he doesn't mind letting you know when you've done something wrong he doesn't mind telling you that he sort of it's very clear we are friends this I didn't like it when you did that. I did like it when you did this. He's very clear. He's got great boundaries. And I think I wanted to show the different ways that Sam is the stream best friend. Letty, who is kind of spiky in her own way because she's so mm. kind of aggressively well-behaved. I think the Guardian said she was aggressively well-behaved, mm. which I thought was so funny. <laughs> and and mm. I thought these three quite different kids. And also that thing of they're the only three kids on board. There's, mm. Nettie's got a little brother, but they're the only three kids of the same age on board the ship. Mm. And I do, I want to hear Catherine's take on writing about ships because I found yeah. it an interesting constraint. But yeah, they're the only three kids on board. And what happens when you put three quite different people in quite an intense situation and how that can actually make you open up and mm. try things and see 
that fighting this connection is is much harder than sometimes mm. letting it in mm. absolutely yeah no, it definitely is a really interesting friendship um and and all the kind of the, the 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 highs and lows of it i thought you did incredibly well you know you weren't always quite sure whether they liked each other but they kind of bonded even so they even though they you know they weren't always completely at ease with each other were they at all it wasn't like a sort of i don't know it didn't all happen overnight shall we say it kind of they grew into each yeah. other didn't they in a way and it was just so well done i, I thought it was brilliant um lucy what about yours because yours were yours were more um so the, 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 a big class difference between the two characters um so what, yeah what kind of brings them to your two together fashion mm -hmm. um so i i d when i first started writing this book um i didn't have two points of view i only had uh sylvia's point of view who is mm. the aristocratic lady and what I realized is actually it's really hard to understand how extraordinary it would have been to be that privileged and to be a member of the aristocracy at that time. And actually you have to have someone else's eyes looking at that world mm. for the reader mm. because it's so bonkers. Mm. It's just such a bonkers world. And I thought, right, actually it's not working just her because she's in her own bubble and that's part of the book really that Myrtle really sees Sylvia's privilege that she doesn't see at mm -hmm. all herself and it's not her fault because that's the only world that she knows and so I think I wanted to explore both of those things and also to explore what it would have been like to be a girl um, at that time but to be a girl that was from a working class background and then to be a girl from a very privileged background. So that was sort of one of the things. But I also think I really just loved when I was young um, and I still do the idea of like just girls and the way their friendship groups work and how fun. And I met a teacher at school said to me last week, um, you know, at least in the holidays you don't have to hear all day long girls singing really loudly together <laughs> and I was like that's one of my favorite things about school when you hear them all singing um because <laughs> it's like real joy and just yeah fun or like dancing together and I think that is really kind of well maybe not I don't know I'm not in a group of boyfriends but um mm. You know, to me, that's like being a group of girls together. Mm. And when I was young, I loved Babysitters Club. I loved Mallory Towers. I loved, and I love those things where everyone's just laughing and. Mm. That that was something I really liked about your your book was the fact that when Myrtle turns up at the house for the first time, you think, uh oh, here we go. She's gonna, you know, it's gonna be the bitchy housemaid, and there's gonna be, you know, the and there wasn't the girls at the house, the other housemaids were so lovely and really accommodating, and you know, take her to her room and and you know, they're just adorable to her, and I really like that because that could quite easily have turned into a little obstacle, couldn't it, and a little kind of challenge for her. And actually, you didn't do that. You kind of you you were very you very much about sort of celebrating. That, that closeness and that sense of, of, of them bit all being together and, and looking out for each other. And I really, I really enjoyed that. I thought that was lovely. I think the mean girls thing can be overdone a bit and not yeah. always true. I witness all the time mm. girls being amazing to each other and really mm. supportive and mm. so kind and just so inclusive. Mm. And, you know, and I think, I think that's one of the best things about being a girl and your friendships and, and yeah. how Think that could be so yeah I did I didn't want to do that and so, someone else commented on that in an interview actually and I mm. yeah I didn't I didn't want it to be like that because I think actually it probably wouldn't have been I don't no know. they were probably like like, like sort of an adopted family weren't they really exactly. or sisters exactly. you know that kind of sense of somebody you sort of live and sleep and work and you know you sharing so much so much intimate um, day to day stuff that yeah, probably, they probably did feel like sisters too. So yeah, I mean, that certainly was really, really, I really enjoyed that bit. So, um, Catherine, about your friends, your friendships in your story. Again, you've got class differences, haven't you? Quite a lot between the different. Yeah, no, gender. definitely. I feel like um, we could probably just talk for an entire hour just about friendship because I feel like this is such a kind of crucial element of all of our books. 
Um, but I think, yeah, I, I think, you know, sort of um, Lucy and Ella have kind of touched on two of the things that were really important to me to reflect in all the friendships that are in the books, actually. Because, um, of course, there's the central friendship between Sophie and Lil. It's really the sort of heart of, of the series. Mm. But then there's also this sort of bigger ensemble cast around them of sort of supporting friendships, too. And um, I love an ensemble cast, like, so I really enjoyed writing that and the different dynamics between the different characters, you know, whether that's... Um, you know, the, the the friendships that are boy and girl friendships that are not necessarily romantic in any way, or that mm. there's like mentor type friendships that there can be different types of relationships in the mix. Um, but I think definitely what Lucy said about the sort of the joy and the loveliness of the sort of really supportive friendship, um, I wanted that to be there, but also sort of what Ella was pointing to about the fact that sometimes our friendships, especially when we're growing up, are not totally straightforward. You know, there can be ups and downs um, along the way. And I, I think that with Sophie and Lil's friendship, I sort of wanted to show that, you know, they are great friends and there's a lot of joy in their friendship, but also they don't always agree. They're very different from each other. And so, you know, we sort of see them navigate that over the course mm. of the series. And we see them sort of be there for each other in spite of the times that they don't agree or, or the times that they, their differences sort of make themselves felt. And ultimately I think we see them grow together. And that was sort of really important for me in this last book to sort of see how that friendship had evolved and sort of how they had strengthened each other really. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, they're sort of on the cusp at the end of this book of sort of, you know, being grown ups essentially. Um, yeah. And I sort of really wanted to show how they'd sort of helped each other to get to that point. Yeah. Um, but whenever I'm talking about friendships in these books, I always have to come back to um, when I was writing the very first book, The Clockwork Sparrow. Um, you know, I sort of knew that I, I wanted friendship to be a really important part of the story and that was always there. But there was just this big click moment, um, which was when my brilliant, brilliant agent, Louise, had been to the cinema to watch Frozen, which shows you how long it was ago that I was writing The Clockwork Sparrow. <laughs> And she just came back to me like really excited and was like, it's all about the relationship between Sophie and Lil. Like I can see that now. Mm -hmm. And it was just that magical moment where she'd seen something in the way that story centered on the relationship between Elsa and Anna and realized that actually, you know, there was the mystery, there's the detective, there's all the different bits, but it's that relationship that is really the heart of the story. Mm -hmm. And that's the point. And I think, you know, I don't want to say too much about the end of the book for anybody who's not read it yet, but I think for those of you who have read the end of the book, I think hopefully it's that relationship that I really wanted to do justice to mm. at the end of the series. I thought it was perfect, story. actually. Yeah. I, I thought it was really, and we'll talk about that a bit in, in, in later on, but that, I thought it was really, really perfect, that ending. It was just the send-off they needed, actually. Um, really hard thing to do, I'd imagine, but... Yeah. yeah, and I'm really glad to hear you say that because, the, as mm -hmm. I say, I just really wanted to do justice to yeah. them and to their relationships. So, yeah, yeah I do hope so. Absolutely. Right, I think it's time for a quick fire round now. I think we've been, um, we've been neglecting talking about cake, so I think we probably need to. Um, and it's one word answers, please, um, if you don't mind, so we can rush through these. So, Catherine, first of all, my first question is, what's the book you wish you'd written? Ooh, so hard. Um, I'm going to say The Lost Art of Keeping Secrets by Eva Rice. It's mm. just so lovely. Okay. Uh, Lucy, what about you? Book you wish you'd written? Pride and Prejudice. Okay. Ella? <laughs> Secret History, I think. <gasps> Ooh, nice choice. Okay. Um, next question. Um, which era do you wish you could live in, um, Ella? The, this one word thing is really not... <laughs> No, it's dreadful, isn't it? No, I, the thing is... I think that's about 50 now, Ella, come on. <laughs> the thing is, I am a real sucker for, like, the Victorian era when I set the book, but also I like so many things about being alive now. I like the internet and antibiotics and, uh, you know... Okay, so are we going to go with Victorian, though? We're going to have to pull the plug on you there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, Victorians. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, like... 7th, 16th century France, like before they were all going to kill them, but amazing, massive dresses. Okay, yep. Yeah. Um, Catherine? I'm sorry, I'm just going with now, even in a pandemic. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, next question is... 
but yeah yeah now. yeah okay next one is the most important one what's your favorite type of cake favorite type of cake Catherine oh date and walnut Ooh, nice. same Lucy I don't know how you say it Milfoy Mil okay what is, that? Is, that, is that that really layered one with all the paint yeah they yeah. do it on like bake-off don't that. they yeah okay thank you and Ella date and walnut like Catherine Date and walnut. My mum used to make that. Cool. And it's, it's always really moist, like isn't it? it? Yeah. It's yeah. Make it. A proper one, isn't it? Proper homemade cake. Okay. Um, so you, you've time travelled to the past. Uh, this is Ella. <laughs> I'm, I'm stealing myself now. Um, and you can take either central heating or the internet with you. Which one will you take? The internet. Okay. Lucy? <laughs> Central heating. Catherine? Internet. You can put on another jumper. Well, no, you can also go online and find a heating engineer. <laughs> I thought you meant like the Stone Age. Like, oh. <laughs> well, you can go to the Stone Age if you want to with oh, your internet. No, or your oh, I picked the internet too. Okay, <laughs> fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> right. Um, oh, what else we got here on my little list? Um, 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 where would you like to travel next? And it's got to be a place you haven't been to yet, as in, you know, a country or a city, not a kind of time frame. So, Lucy, we'll start with you. Hawaii. Oh, nice. Ella? I want to go to Rwanda. Okay. Interesting. Um, Catherine? Japan for me. Mm, absolutely. I, I'm quite interested in going to Japan as well. I think I might have to hide in your suitcase. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Right, we've got some questions coming in by the looks of it. We've got three in our Q&A box so far. Um, so that's fantastic. And we've got somebody who's saying a um, big thank you to us as well. Um, so we'll, we'll come to those in a second. Um, which, But it does lead us rather nicely on to our next question, which is all about travel. And the fact that travel is a really big thing in all of your books, very literally so for Catherine and Ella, and sort of it's a kind of a metaphor for something, isn't it, really, for f freedom and adventure and all that kind of thing in, in Lucy's story as well. Um, so, Catherine, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about um, who travels where and what goes on and how that affects, you know, the things that happen in your story. Sure. So, um the Taylor and Rose Secret Agents books are obviously very much inspired by kind of like the early spy stories. Um, so I really knew straight away that I wanted to do that kind of whole like planes, trains, automobiles kind of thing, which obviously works so perfectly with an early 20th century setting. Mm. You know, you've got lots of new technology going on. There's lots of fun things you can explore with the idea of travel. Um, but I also really wanted to explore different cities and locations. And again, I feel like that's very spy book. You know, you watch James Bond film. He's always mm. popping into some different exotic location. Um, but actually, on reflection, I also think it's probably um, no coincidence that I was writing these um, around the time that sort of Brexit was going on. And I think I was really thinking about all the fun I had in my late teens, kind of doing things like interrailing around Europe and and um, just exploring and adventuring and sort of really wanting to um, show that and celebrate that at a time when it felt like that was really important. And um, so that was kind of where the, the travel theme came from. And, you know, having written four books that sort of so, saw Sophie and Lil sort of moving about London, exploring different spaces and um, places within the city, it was actually really fun to put them into new environments that were unfamiliar to them and see, well, like, how are they going to find, you know, uh, Paris or St. Petersburg or in this book, um, New York. Um, so, yeah, and it felt really appropriate for the time period as well, in the sense that, you know, we've got these young women who are suddenly becoming more empowered um, to explore and to do new things. So to sort of see them physically doing that by going to new and different places felt really exciting. And do you want to Obviously. tell us a little bit about your ship? Because um, the SS Mariana, I think, is it the SS Mariana? I'm not making that up. Yeah. Um, you, you had, there's a little bit of a sort of um, a, a, an echo of another famous transatlantic boat journey, wasn't there, in your 
in your writing of it. Sorry, is this in, in mine or in Ella's? Yeah, in yours. Oh, yes. OK, yes. So I, of course. You're not the SS Mariana, are you? Um, Sorry. <laughs> so, yes, obviously, in Nightfall in New York, I knew that they were going to have to go to New York by Ocean Liner, which was how you travelled to New York at that time. And as soon as I made that connection, I immediately knew that this was going to have to be a little bit of a Titanic tribute. Um, I think like pretty much everybody else my age, I saw the film Titanic in the cinema when it came out. I think it was about 13, maybe 14. Uh, and I was obviously obsessed with it, as we all were at that time. So I 100% enjoyed myself, fully immersing myself in... There were quite a few icebergs, weren't there? <laughs> Yeah, uh, in, in Titanic and um, just having my, a bit of fun doing a little tribute to um, the film, but also, of course, like the real history of the Titanic, which is completely fascinating. Mm. And I went down such a research rabbit hole and um, finding out about all of the intricacies of the Titanic and the whole, you know, all of the stories that surrounded that, the stories of the passengers, the stories of the rescue boat. Um, there was actually kind of one moment when I was like, hang on, maybe this isn't one book, maybe it's two books because I just felt like there was so much that I could have yeah. done a whole book just on a sort of Titanic inspired ship um, but yeah that was that was a total uh, joy to research um, and I also learned there is a lot of information online about the Titanic like yes, a lot there's a website called the Encyclopedia Titanica if you want to know anything about the Titanic, like, you know, what <laughs> window latches they had or <gasps> whose cabin number was what, you can wow. find it. Gosh, how fascinating. I want, so I want to read it again now. I just, now I've heard you say all that and talk about it. I just, oh, yeah, I love that bit of the book. And Ella, your book is, your entire book pretty much is set on board uh, ship. So why, why did you make that choice for your characters? Your characters are, are on a journey too, aren't they, for um, slightly different reasons? partly the idea came to me completely as these three children are on a ship and someone is they see someone fall overboard or be pushed overboard or many spoilers um so the ship was always kind of integral to the to the story but I think also there's something really interesting about like essentially it's kind of a locked room mystery it's there's mm. no one can get off no one can get on there's no time you can't no one can escape there's a set time frame which is a really fun thing to have as a writer mm. and actually it was quite interesting because I looked at setting on a big ship so most people going from India to England or the other way around in 1892 which is when my story set would have gone a much bigger ship than mine and even if you just kept it to first class or second class or steerage class there would be so many people that it would kind of invalidate the locked room nature mm. of it so I did a lot of thinking and I spent a lot of time at the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich. I was really lucky that I got to spend that time there basically just before the pandemic happened and everything shut down and they were incredibly helpful and they let me look at all these handbooks and maps and things which was amazing but I couldn't figure it out and then my granddad actually was like oh you should put it on a mail ship that's much smaller much more convenient much hand more handy and that really clicked for me I thought mm. okay great I can sort of do what I want with this because if you're getting passage on a mail ship then it's all a bit out of the ordinary anyway and it kind of fitted with this sense of this kind of sense of Isabel being a bit forgotten and it all being a bit last minute and a bit no one's booked her on a ship I loved re I have to say though when I was reading Catherine's book I did think I could have put more ship detail in I loved all the ship detail I really felt like you'd been on the website and you knew the latches <laughs> <laughs> it's a rabbit hole though isn't it I mean you could just but, go down there forever when you start researching funnily enough my granddad just finished reading the secret detective this morning and while he really likes it he is concerned at the lack of ship detail <laughs> <laughs> and so I think the ship was always kind of integral what I wasn't expecting was how how much it would kind of consume me, the plotting. So I did a lot of things about, okay, how many days? So if you, so each chapter in my book has the date and the place. Yeah. The time and the place. So how far into the voyage they are, how far they've travelled. And that was a headache. Mm. <laughs> that was yeah. a big map spread across the sitting room floor and me literally moving. I think I had a penny to mark the ship and being like, okay, this may get... Mm. There is one place where a serious ship historian could definitely fault how long it takes them to get from A to B. But I'm not going to say what it is. And that ship historian can uh, read it and write to me, write me a critical note. But I do know it's, I do know that I had to fudge the time a little bit because it was mm. just difficult. 
to make it work otherwise. But I really liked the idea of travel and I really liked the idea kind of of slow travel. Mm. I think we live in an age of really quick movement and I think it was very interesting. So this book was originally supposed to come out in the middle of the pandemic, but actually I got to work on it in this time where travel was very curtailed and it felt very slow and very paperwork heavy. So quite a lot of my family are abroad. So I've not seen, not seen anyone in my family for 18 months really. Um, so lots of my family are abroad and it suddenly became this thing of, well, travel is very difficult very difficult and very expensive and you have to have the paperwork in order and it takes a long time to plan and I, it was very interesting to be exploring a previous time of paperwork and slowness and journeys being this kind of almost a more deliberate thing mm. now. I'm very essential as well rather than just because you fancied it. There's yeah. not a sense of we're going on holiday it's a sense of we must make this journey yeah which I found really interesting I think the only bit in my book that's kind of directly influenced by this last year is there is a section where papers get checked for illness, mm. which I wrote yeah. before the pandemic. And then when I was kind of going through it, I thought, oh, that is what this is like. My mm. parents had to, my parents have moved, they were living in the Middle East, but in, have moved to back to Europe over the course of the last year. And I would say, I was surprised at how Victorian it all felt. There was lots of like showing one person a marriage certificate and then having proof of this and proof of that and proof of your immunizations and clean bills of health and it all felt very victorian so i think those elements have weirdly it felt weirdly prescient so those elements mm. of the journey and movement have felt weirdly current again now which has been yeah. very cool as a fiction writer mm. Mm. absolutely yeah lucy what about your journey because it's there is there's a great bit in you i have to say you know the, the journey the big journey um I won't give too much away. The big journey obviously takes place sort of off the page, but there's a brilliant bit where they they hijack a horse and and gallop down to the dot. I love that bit. It's like go on, go on. Um, but why why do you think? Uh, well, what does what, what does travel represent in your book? Even though most of the events actually happen in you know it, within that house. Yeah, I think um, when I researched this book, um, I, I read a lot of accounts uh, which you can find at the British Library uh, of being a debutante so um, lots and lots of diaries of people who were debutantes and um, and one of the things that you really really kind of feel is how restricted their lives were so they might have gone to Paris to get this amazing wardrobe to be a debutante but they were never allowed to mm. do anything by themselves and I think um, I definitely recommend it if you haven't read the book Hons and Rebels by Jessica Mitford there's a wonderful bit in that where she just talks about you know how they're never allowed to go anywhere and going to a department store by herself when she kind of runs away and and how exciting that is to her and and I think that feeling of um, really I really noticed the contrast when I started to read accounts of sort of um, you know below stairs communities so ma maids and um, you know, how things like looking forward to going to like May Day celebrations or, you know, being allowed to kind of go out with someone if you like them and, and sort of do that, you know, even in not as we do now, but you could go and meet them and that would have been Haunting. an OK thing to do. Yeah. And so I kind of that idea of what is freedom, mm. you know, if travel represents freedom, you know, you might go on like a grand tour room with a view type experience but you would always have been with a chaperone or you would have you know and it would always have been um sort of very very controlled and so I think um yeah the idea of what travel and escape and freedom and what that means to the girls is sort of very different and there's a scene um which I took actually from a diary um, that I read where, um, you know, Myrtle observes how excited um, Sylvia and Agapanther are to just be on a bus, where to her she's been getting buses, you know, probably since she was seven or eight, and that wouldn't have been a big thing to her. So I guess just the, yeah, I think, um, and the big kind of travel in the book, um, again, that was based on something I, I, that a librarian actually at, at the V&A told me about, um, and, and about an expedition where, um, yeah, it, it was rumoured that the person who applied sort of went and they weren't quite sort of who they said they were. 
um so I loved yeah. that I loved the I mean I won't give it a, a, the ending away but I loved the ending on that that it sort of all turned out all right anyway if you see what I mean it was um yeah it was that was really clever and and that, that really there's a lot of journeying towards something in an emotional sense for them isn't there there's, that there's a they, they talk about that a lot in your story about sort of being who they really want to be and you know fulfilling their dreams and um I think a lot of Sylvia's dreams are kind of everybody thinks they're slightly ridiculous don't they and they think she's just an eccentric little child who runs around with a sort of cape tied to her shoulders <laughs> all the time um, I love but when she meets yeah and when she meets Myrtle he's actually got sort of concrete ambition you know that she a, a thing she wants to do she kind of learns from that herself doesn't she quite a lot yeah um, definitely and also realizing how skilled or not you know you've been allowed to become Mm. Um, and and again that having skills having being able to do things is also enables you to have freedom and enables you to travel and do things yeah. and, and you certainly get the sense from them that Myrtle that Sylvia is more in awe of Myrtle than the other way around don't you <laughs> that you know she's the one who's who's the richer person in a way yeah and I, I definitely wanted that to be the case I didn't want Sylvia to be the one with all the cards because I don't no. think she would have been no um, I don't think she would have been either I think you did that really well so yeah yeah okay well it's nearly quarter past but I want to ask you another question really really quickly so this might be our last question before we go over to our audience questions um now we've got Ella's written a standalone, we think, at the moment. Uh, although we're hoping it's not. I'm hoping it's not. <laughs> For now. Um, Lucy's, now. Lucy's written the first book in a series. Catherine's written the final book in a series. So you, you're all at different... These stories have all kind of um, fulfilling a slightly different purpose in a way. So, Catherine, can you tell us just very quickly um, how writing this book... What, what are the challenges of writing a book that's like the end of a series? Uh -huh. How long have you got? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Not very long. Yeah, of course. Um, well, obviously, a series gives you a lot of space. There's like a whole world that you're constructing and building, peopled with, in my case, probably far too many characters, lots of settings, lots of details. And um, I have loved that. And I've loved doing that in, uh, with these books. But of course, with the last book, what you're trying to do is to bring all that together and with it being a mystery as well, there are obviously a lot of loose ends that needed to be um, tied up. You know, this is the end of a four book series, but really it's kind of ultimately an eight book series. Um, so there's a lot there to draw together. And I did feel like that was the big challenge of writing this book was to, to pull all of those threads in and to really give those characters and, you know, the journey that we've been on with them um, a really emotionally satisfying and sort of meaningful conclusion but I didn't also didn't want to shut the door too dramatically on the story I think I personally don't really enjoy it when books do that um, you know certain books which sort of then tell you exactly what happened to everybody when mm, they grew up mm, and and mm. every uh, detail is is sort of finished I wanted there to be some space for the reader's imagination as well and for you to sort of feel like where you think um those characters might go next or, or what might happen next um so yes it was just the the kind of tightrope balance if you like of those two elements um the the satisfying conclusion but also just that little bit of mm. possibility that we have at the end of the series absolutely you do that so well because we know these are sort of very these characters aren't suddenly going to sit down and you know be doing their knitting are they not, not there's anything wrong with knitting we love a bit of knitting but then they're the sort of characters who are going to sit have very adventure some you know interesting lives so the, the, the door isn't going to shut on them you know they are going to be very sort of engaged with the world for for you know they are going to go on and do something exciting and big you know I mean what what would you do would you do after you know all the things they've been through and I love the fact that you know some of the characters they all go off in sort of slightly different directions don't they but there's that sense like you say that they're all they're all going off into the world as very fulfilled people and that which I think is, is really as a reader that's really satisfying because you think oh they're all right they're all right they, they're, they're where they need to be and that's that's good so I really liked that that was that was um, what a job to do that all that excitement all that adventure and you know bringing that to an end so bravo <laughs> thank you um Lucy what about yours yours was, yours the opening book of a yeah 
Yes, um, I think I did always know that I wanted it to be a series. Mm. Um, and I knew that I wanted it to explore different places and sort of different um, stages of where they get to, uh, especially in the 1920s, there's mm -hmm. lots of amazing things happening in the fashion world. And I knew I wanted to, um, you know, the second book set in Hollywood. And I always, I love um, kind of golden age Hollywood. And I, mm. I really love those clothes. Have and you written so that book yet? It's almost finished. <laughs> um, but I mean, again, uh, Catherine was talking um, earlier, you know, about, how it's hard it's been in the pandemic. And I was supposed to go to the MGM archives um, in Hollywood to see Ooh. all the clothes. Yeah, and that would have been absolutely amazing. And I was supposed to go twice um, and I'm still hoping to go. Mm. But yeah, so I always knew I wanted, I sort of always knew the arc of the fashion. Yeah. Um, I think, and I don't know what Catherine thinks about this, but I went through this mad time and I don't know if you've done this, where I started Googling like about sequels. Have you ever done that, Catherine? I started Googling and it's that is a crazy thing to get into because you sort of start reading all of these things, especially about movies and they kind of tell you and then it like boggles your brain. And I think what you have to go back to is the characters and their kind of development and where they would be at that point and sort of mm. let it grow from them and not read things about how they made alien 2 and things like that because that's <laughs> not that's not a useful uh way to spend your time so ella don't do that um, <laughs> when you come to write the second one but yeah it's it has been um yeah i i, I was excited to get to carry on yeah i mean i've never written a sequel really apart from in when we're warriors a little you know sort of t t stuck my toe in the water a little bit um so i'm really intrigued as to how you do it um, yeah, I just find it absolutely fascinating. And, and why haven't you? I don't know. I think it's because um, I don't know. I, I actually don't know why. I I, I can't answer that because I don't know. I think maybe I haven't had an idea that kind of would keep going. I don't know. Um, nobody's wanted one. <laughs> okay. Probably more like one. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, a little boy, I was funny enough, a little boy the other day, um, I was doing a school visit and he said to me, um, have you written any any series? And I said, no, I haven't. And he said, why not? And I said, I don't know why not. I just haven't. And they, I said, why do you like them? He said, yeah, I really like series. I really, that, that's my favourite type of book to read because I know, you know, I'm not having to start again from scratch. I know where I am and I can sort of jump in and, the, and into the story quickly. So I think they are very popular, aren't they, with, with younger readers because of that. Ella, what about yours then? We were discussing, weren't we, before we came on air, I have to be really quick here because we, we're 20 past now. Um, we were we were hoping, or I was hoping, <laughs> trying to twist your arm to write a sequel <laughs> uh, because there, there is so many so much possibility at the end of your book, um, but you don't know yet, do you? No, well, the thing is, I think I know what's good, what would happen to all my characters next. I don't think they'll stop being friends. I hope they wouldn't stop solving solving crimes. But it's just sort of a timing thing and I've got lots of other projects and I've got another kind of middle grade story that I'm really excited about which is nothing nothing to do with this it's a completely different set mm. of characters and a completely different set of ideas so I've got to do that first mm. yeah <laughs> just, fair think, enough everyone is just saying don't promise anything else don't say yeah anything. yeah yeah um, that is the trouble just, isn't it I think the other thing is I've got lots I'm a very kind of <laughs> butterfly minded person I was like oh that looks exciting oh over there look up there do this do that yeah I like a lot and I read a lot of different types of books so I, I feel like there's no consistency in the kind of books I like to read and mm. I feel like there's almost no consistency in the kind of books I like to write mm. and so I'm probably not going to do a sequel for a bit just because there's lots of other kind of ideas and types of writing that I'm excited to mm. do for a while I really admire people who can kind of commit mm. in the long term to being to these mm. characters I imagine it feels very nice to stay with stay with friends for a long time. Mm, I sometimes feel yeah. like, oh no, I need to go back and oh, hang out with them for a while. Oh, yeah, I, need to tie up. I want to go and see them. So we'll see. Watch this space. Yeah. Okay. Watch this space. Thank you. Thanks, ladies, very much for your quest for your answers. That was they were fantastic, and I, we could probably <laughs> be nattering all day, couldn't we? Okay. So we have got some questions here from various people, and I'm going to start with um, this one um from hang on let's have a look because some of them are specific and some of them are general 
So we're going to go with Chantel Shepherd, first of all, who has asked, who inspired you to become an author? So Ella, would you like to answer that one? Who inspired you? I think inspired is a difficult question. I just sort of always had this as my plan from re being really tiny. I remember just thinking, oh, I'm going to write books. That's what I'm going to do. And I think a lot of people around me were like, OK, that's good, but also have a backup. And mm. I kind of just like, well, I must I must write books. And the thing is, that's basically what I've done. I've written lots of things for money and lots of kind of boring things, lots of sort of boring things about money or boring kind of bits of adverts or whatever. But ultimately, writing was very much, it's my heart, it's what I love to do. Mm, I can't yeah. really imagine, I can't imagine being me and not writing all the time. Yeah. And sometimes I get to write fun things like mystery novels. And sometimes I get to write dull things that no one ever knows about me mm. to make money. But either way, I think that's kind of, mm. I just always knew I loved reading. I think I loved reading so much. I couldn't imagine not being involved in mm. making books. Mm. Okay, thank you. That's an interesting answer. What about you, Lucy? Who inspired you, do you think? Um, I don't know inspired, but I went on, um, I went on an Arvon Foundation oh, writing. Arvon! Book. I um, love... Yeah, for teachers. And I, I went, and um, anyway, and I, I, I've always enjoyed mm. writing. And um, anyway, I was, you go and you have to, you know, bring something you're working on. And... Um, the author Celia yeah. Reese, you know, who wrote yes. this. Love, yeah. love that book. She was the tutor, and she was amazing. And, and anyway, I, I showed her my stuff, and she was really nice about it. And then all the um, towards the end of the week, because you go to five for five days, she said to me, um, "You know, I'd written this quite serious sort of book because I think I always had the idea that maybe if you're a writer you had to be like very serious because you were kind of having big thoughts and thinking serious things um and and she said to me you love writing funny things you love telling jokes and like that's who you are like you've got so many funny stories about school and you know and she said why don't you try and write a funny book because you know you're funny and you could do that and and she said why don't you try and write something funny and send it to me um because she said I really think you should consider it and and I did and and that was um the first book I had published so really it was because she sort of um yeah I don't know why I had this idea of being a writer that wasn't you know I just had this idea of it being this really like you could only do it if you were super serious but a lot of people say don't they, that writing humor or writing comedy is harder because you know what you how you deliver something might be sort of comedic, you know, when you're doing it sort of, you know, live, but on the page, it's somehow, you know, quite often falls apart. But all of you have got those elements, all of all three of you, got the, there are elements in your stories that are quite amusing. <laughs> you know, little, little observations and little, it's the characters, it's the way they kind of bounce off each other and stuff. Um, is just brilliant because that's how friendships are, aren't they? They're, they're not, you're not always sitting around having mega serious conversations about the meaning of life. You're often just being daft with each other and that kind of, you know, bonds you as much as the serious stuff, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's definitely a... shape. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I like that. The idea of being inspired by Celia Reese. I think that's a, that's a pretty yeah. good, pretty I'm good. Directed by, I was directed yeah. by Celia Reese. Yeah, Reeves. absolutely. If you haven't yeah. read, I was going to say, just a couple of things for people listening. The Arvon Foundation is a, a charitable organisation that runs creative writing courses and they are superb. Um, often taught by published writers and yeah so that's what we're talking about the Arvon Foundation and Celia Reese is the author of Witch Child which is uh, and as of many other books as well and she's a brilliant um, historical fiction author and, and just author generally. Um, Catherine who's inspired you? Yeah so I've answered this question a lot in the past and I always tend to say the same thing which is that it was really the books that I loved growing up that inspired me you know I didn't really come into contact with writers or anything like that but I just knew that I loved books and the idea of of writing them myself was like the best thing that I could imagine but I actually think I probably should amend my answer to this question because I was thinking about it and I think I did think that but the idea of actually doing it felt quite like distant and remote like it felt like something that other people could do or sort mm. of like mysterious people who you know I grew up in the northwest people who came from London and and you know who you know were sort of fancy in some way that I wasn't you know could do um but I had this teacher when I was about 14 I think about year nine 
And I remember she um, gave me some really great feedback on work that I'd done. And at the end of a lesson, she pulled me over and she said, you know, you're a really good writer. I think you could be a writer one day. Like, I think you could write a book one day. And it was just amazing. Like, it was just mm. like this moment where I sort of went, like, mm. that's like a real thing that I could actually do. And yeah, I just think that was a really important moment in making me think that that was something that I could actually really do for a job mm. or, or not, you know, just, just to have a book published. And mm. um, yeah, so shout out to that teacher, Miss O'Neill in year nine. Um, yeah, we never forget them, do we? Path. Those yeah those teachers who who just recognize something in you that maybe you haven't yet recognized yourself uh it gives you that real confidence to to sort of imagine you know where this might go or what you might do with that they're, they're so powerful and have such an important role in our lives um, because i would say you know i get asked that question a lot about you know who inspires you and it's always mm. my english teacher mm. um, so shout out to english teachers generally yeah. who are and librarians and not librarians yeah absolutely yeah um, okay, let's have a look and see what else we've got here then. There are lots of questions for you, Catherine, um, on the Clockwork Sparrow, on Taylor and Rose, on um, Secrets on the Shore. Who are you most similar to? Let's ask you this one quickly. Who are you most similar to, Lil or Sophie? Oh gosh, um, I wish I could say I was similar to Lil. I'm definitely not. I love writing her, but she's like the opposite of me in so many ways. Of the two, I'm probably more of a Sophie, but there's ne I'm not based. Then neither of them are based on me in any way. So mm -hmm. I don't think I would uh, have Sophie's amazing ability to solve mysteries. In fact, I'd probably be absolutely hopeless as a de detective. So they're really brave <laughs> as well, aren't they? They're just yeah, like, right. Oh, a problem. Great, <laughs> let's run towards it at high speed. Um, yeah, absolutely. There's, um, I think, I don't know if you'll, there is a feature, a function on here where you'll be able to kind of answer some of these questions after the event. I'm not sure. I don't know how we do that, but there's, there's I don't quite think, a lot specifically for you. Actually, I don't think there is, sadly, but maybe no. what I could do is um, if you want to pop over and find me on social media afterwards on yeah. um, Twitter or Instagram, I'm at Follow the Yellow. I'll try and put up a few answers to some of these sort of practical questions about yeah, that would be lovely and, and what's going Thank on. You. Thank you. That'd be really helpful for people. Um, let's have a look. We've got one. I think we've probably got time for one last question. So this is an anonymous attendee. So some, you know, if you imagine, you can imagine somebody in, you know, false beard and glasses. Um, I've been writing since primary school. I'm entering year 11 now. Good for you. I like the, I like the sound of this already and have dozens of works in progress, but I seem to have trouble actually finishing any of them. I'll suddenly get a new idea and start a completely new book while ignoring all the other ones. The furthest I've ever got is chapter 14. Do you have any advice on how to stay focused on one book that I can, so I can actually finish something? Thank you. I think we can all identify with that, can't we? Just that <laughs> idea of like the, Ella was saying just now about the butterfly mind that, I, you know, all these ideas, you know, coming at you. <laughs> That's what I was just going to say is even now I have hundreds of unfinished projects. I would yeah, say yeah. most days I think of a new idea that I would like to write. The only thing that has worked for me is self-imposed deadlines of being like, I will have this part of this thing finished by this date. And also having a notebook where I write down like a vague synopsis of the new thing I want to do and then use that as the reward to get me to finish the thing I'm currently working on oh and shorter projects being yeah. like could this be a short story could this be flash fiction could I sort of exercise this ghost could I get rid of this quickly in like a couple of hours today so it doesn't drag into the other work but it's a nightmare it's a mm. I think all writers all the writers I know have this thing of being like but the new shiny thing yeah absolutely it, it's kind of it is a, a, probably um, a sign, anonymous attendee, that you are one of us <laughs> because we're all we all kind of recognise what you're talking about. It, it, it's it's you know one of the pitfalls I think of having a creative mind, isn't it? That it's always it never stops. Um, and I so it's is there? I don't know, anonymous person, but I think I always get slower towards the end, and I think it's because I know I have to show it to someone. And then I get cold feet about it. And I'm like, oh, I, I was really like gung ho at the beginning. And I like really went for it. And then closer to the end, I think, oh, no, all the times <laughs> I just finished because I wanted to go out to dinner. And maybe that was a mistake. And maybe I should go back to the beginning. And maybe, you know, and I think that I, yeah, I get really, really slow. So I think if it's maybe a little bit of, you know, well, what will I do at the end? And, you know, then just kind of basic. You just have to. 
Um, you know, one of the most interesting things I heard um, about how, how you do it, how you do this stuff is Hilary McKay talking about how she writes and she says that she writes the end of the book first. I know it's just like mind boggling. So she writes the end of the book first. So she knows you know what the final scene's going to be and she knows how what, how all her characters are going to be and what she's then got to do is work out how they get there so you know that might be an answer to your problem as well um Catherine would you have any sage advice yeah I think I could have written this comment when I was <laughs> sort of at this, this point you know I, I think I remember you know I wrote loads as a teenager and I was always starting projects and not finishing them or sometimes it would sort of almost go the other way and they just become this kind of incredibly long like interconnected thing which didn't really have a beginning or a middle mm. and end but it's really just these same characters and I take one set of characters and I'd like put them in say a school setting and then I'd put them on like holiday and I just sort of like move them around in different mm. settings but there was never really a, a plot or a, a story so I actually think I don't think there's anything wrong with this I think it's it's fine I think mm. you're exploring you're playing you're trying out different things I don't think you necessarily have to put pressure on yourself to finish something and um, I think if you want to press ahead and finish it then I think there's been loads of great advice here on things that you can do um, but um, I think that there's there's space to play as well, and that's sort of part of part of the point. What I did discover when I did finish writing something is that I actually really love writing endings. Mm. I think there's something really pleasurable about feeling like you found the right ending for your story, and about writing those final lines, which is always quite an emotional moment yeah. for me. And um, so yeah. I think you know, if you do want to get to the end, you could have that in your sights that feeling of the sort of satisfaction that you will feel when you get there and you can write the end and you'd be like, I made it, you know, whether it's a short story, whether it's a great long novel, you know, there, there's a great deal of pleasure to have in that. So yes, that's something to, um, to look forward to for sure. Well, I think we're gonna have to stop there, panel. So thank you very, very much for everybody who's joined us today. And thank you to the people who've taken time to answer questions. Um, and just to say, um, Catherine has said, you know, there's a, quite a few questions about Sophie and Lil here. They're so, they're so loved. Um, Catherine will um, answer your questions on social media if you can find her at Follow the Yellow on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. Lucy and Ella as well. An absolute pleasure to talk to you both. These yeah. are such great books, honestly. I really had the most pleasurable hour but also you know the time beforehand just reading these lovely lovely books i've been so excited to talk to you today <laughs> i really have um so lovely to see you all and thank you very much again and just to remind you that these books are available from waterstones um so please check them out and thank Take you emma for being a brilliant thank chair you. thank you, thank you. Oh, thank it's you just so such much. a treat thank you all all right ladies take care